We have just a few short verses for our passage tonight. Second Kings. Second Kings two twenty three through twenty five. Now, we read about, if you were here this morning, we read about Elisha a little later. This is before uh, what we read about this morning. And the story takes a little different turn than the one that uh, it did this morning. So, here we go. Second Kings 2, verses 23. From there, Elisha went up to Bethel as he was walking along the road... Some youths came out from the town and jeered at him. Go on up, you bald head, they said. Go on up, you bald head. He turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the youths. And he went on to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. Well, this morning, Elisha led a group of the enemy soldiers into Samaria, and the king was like, shall we get rid of these guys? And he said, no, in fact, don't do that at all. Put food and water in front of them, send them away, back to their master. And then the raiding parties stopped raiding Israel. But here we have, uh, we have a different sort of encounter. The lesson this morning was, you know, show kindness to your enemies. Well, here it doesn't really seem like that's going on here. Uh, he's, he's getting picked on by some kids, and instead of showing them kindness, he calls down a curse on them. And it says 42 uh, youths were mauled by bears. So, what's up with this story here? We've been going through these kinds of stories all through the summer. What? Why are there certain stories in the Bible? And we'll just take a, a stab at it. Now, maybe you did hear this story in Sunday school if you you know, bad mouth your teacher or were being bad or something like that. And then maybe you might have heard this one, but other than that, I'm guessing that most of you did not hear this story in Sunday school. It's probably not in your children's Bible story book. But what happened? The fact is, is that we don't know too much. This is a short story with only a few details. It doesn't give us a whole lot to go on here. There's a bunch of questions that we could ask that we really don't have the answers to. We don't know why the boys jeered at him. That doesn't say why. We don't know if the boys knew who he was or if they just spotted somebody walking along and decided to pick on him. Um, we don't know if, if he was actually bald or if, as a prophet, that there was some way of shaving his head that distinguished him, um, or even did they wore something that maybe made him look bald or something? Uh, you don't know that. We don't know if the jeering was mocking God, God's message, or was it was just being cruel. We don't know if the kids knew who he was. And we don't know if they were very numerous and maybe even posing a danger to him. I mean, maybe, maybe they weren't, you know, just 42. Maybe there were a bunch of them, and maybe they were looking to get violent. It doesn't say. So there's a bunch of unanswered questions here that we can't really, that we can't really answer any of those. There's a few things that we do know. So here's what we do know. Elisha is God's primary messenger of the time. 
Elisha is God's primary prophet of that time. Elijah, in just the previous chapter, had been taken up to heaven in a whirlwind, and Elisha is now the prophet to succeed Elijah. So he just took over for Elijah. And whenever there's somebody new who comes in, there's always a question of, okay, is the new guy going to live up to what the old guy did? You know, is the new guy made out of the same stuff as the old guy, or is this guy just goofing off? So Elisha is God's primary prophet. Bethel, where he was near, was the center of Israel's false religion. It was the center of Israelite apostasy. When the two kingdoms split, the southern kingdom of Judah and the northern kingdom of Israel, there were two golden calves that were made. And the, nor- the king of the northern country of Israel put one of those calves in Bethel and said, here are your gods who brought you out of Egypt. Now you can worship them here instead of having to go to Jerusalem to worship there. He didn't want all of the people to go to the southern kingdom. You know, we don't want people, just like, we don't want people vacationing in Indiana or Ohio. We want people to vacation in Michigan because that gets our economy going and all of that kind of stuff. And so we have all these advertising slogans, pure Michigan and so forth. Well, there was a little more to that than this, but, but they didn't want them worshiping in Jerusalem. So here you go. Here's one at Bethel and there was another one. But the king primarily worshipped at Bethel. The king of Israel primarily worshipped here at Bethel. And ironically, Bethel means house of God. And yet it was the center of Israelite apostasy. Okay, so Elisha is the primary prophet. Bethel is the center of false religion. Respect for elders and God's representatives is very important to God. We know that quite well. You know, from the, the commandment to honor your father and mother to all of these other commandments later on, there's a lot of honor and respect that you're supposed to pay to your parents, to your elders, um, to those in the New Testament, as it says, who are over you in the Lord. There's respect that you need to have for them. And these kids obviously are not showing this man of God very much respect here. The boys mocked Elisha for going up and being bald. Now, we don't know if what the going up part meant, if uh, they were thinking that he was going to do something like an Elijah and go up to heaven in a whirlwind. We don't know if they knew of any connection there, or they didn't know if, uh, or we don't know why they mocked him for going up to the mountain there. But... They did mock him for being bald, and baldness was, back then, a shameful condition. In fact, a sign of mourning was to shave your head, or dust, and putting on sackcloth, and so forth. And uh, it it was a sign that you were devastated. That something just awful happened. It's almost like nothing matters anymore. I don't, my honor and dignity is gone. I'm just going to shave my head. So it was a sign of mourning. So being bald was not something that they esteemed. And again, we don't know if he actually was bald or if he just was kind of bald, or if it was some sort of, you're a prophet and so you shave your head this certain way, we don't know that. 
but then Elisha cursed them by God's name. If you look in your text there, the word Lord in verse 24 is in all capital letters, so that means he's invoking the covenant God's name. So he's cursing them in the name of the Lord. Now, usually when that name appears in the Bible, something good happens. Or God does something amazing. Things get turned around. In this case, well, I guess it's amazing, but I'm not sure it's all that, all that, uh, I, 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 I don't know, what do we make of this? The Lord brings these bears out and they maul 42 of the youths. But it's surprising that Elisha curses them by God's covenant name. Usually that name is reserved for special purposes. And it doesn't say it in the NIV, but in other versions it says, two female bears come out and maul the 42 boys. Or in some version it says they tore them to pieces. So two bears tear to pieces 42 of the boys. Now, if you do just some simple math, 42 divided by 2 is 21. So each one of those bears would have had to have gotten 21 kids. Now, now I'm not an expert on bear attacks or anything like that, but if you're attacked by a bear, you don't usually just stand there, I don't think. I can imagine all the kids would have scattered. But the bears still getting 42 of them, even after they're... These must have been super bears. I mean, catching 21 apiece? I don't know. And it, Proverbs is just interesting little thing here. Better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool in his folly. It's better to meet a bear robbed of her cubs than a fool in his folly. Well, if these kids were fools and participating in folly, then they got something better then, apparently, according to that proverb. And then it says, Elisha went to Mount Carmel and then to Samaria. Mount Carmel is where Elijah was taken up. And Samaria was Israel's capital city. So Elisha went to where Elijah was taken up and then to Israel's capital city. That's where most of his work was going to need to be done. Because Israel was following other gods. That's the center of the nation. That's where his work has to be. So, the whole Old Testament is supposed to point to Christ and supposed to point to the grace of Christ. So, where is Christ and where is grace in this story? Well, I'll just take a stab at it. And again, it's, it's just kind of strange that this is kind of like a, almost like a different Elisha from the one that we heard about this morning when he had mercy on these bands of Arameans who were out to capture him. But in this short story, there's really nothing new or different about God at all. All over the Bible, God always promises mercy for the humble and punishment of the proud. That's all over the Bible. 
So that's nothing new. In Proverbs 3, 33 through 34, I think I have that on the screen. There we go. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. He mocks proud mockers, but gives grace to the humble. And then in 1 Peter 5, young men in the same way be submissive to those who are older. So there you go. You have another respect your elders thing. And then it says, all of you clothe yourselves with humility toward one another because God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. So even if Elisha is different here, there's nothing different about God here. God is a God who shows mercy to people who are humble and he shows his wrath to people who turn their back on him. God is about both love and justice, both mercy and punishment. And you can't really have one without the other. God's justice and his love really go together. And his mercy and his punishment really go together. Even just look at the cross itself. The cross is punishment, and yet it's his justice. The cross is God's love to us, but it's also his justice. It's terrible, it's punishment. So even in the cross itself, you have both. And it's like they're inseparable. In Hebrews 6, it says this, Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessing of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. So, again, the word cursed. Those who turn their back on God, disregard Him, reject Him, they are in danger of being cursed. And in the end, as it says, burned. Even the passage that is often quoted as one of God's ultimate grace passages that you might use to somebody that you were even witnessing to. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Just two verses later, it says this, Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. So even the, the verse that we might think of first as a demonstration of God's love, there's God's justice that's right next to it. You can't have the one without the other. I don't know if any of you, um, I probably, well, I know Cedric knows, but uh, recently there was a church that was making a new hymnal, not the Christian Reformed or the Reformed Church, but uh, there was a Presbyterian church that's making a new hymnal. And uh, that song that's a newer song, In Christ Alone, I think most of you are familiar with that song, they, uh, in their hymnal committee, decided to not include that song. Because there's a line in that song. It says, Till on the cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. Well, they wanted to change that. They wanted to change it to, Till on the cross as Jesus died, the love of God was magnified. Now, We've had 
there's been a bunch of discussions about this, whether that, that was the right thing to do or not. Is it wrong, that, wrong to say that the love of God was magnified by Christ on the cross? No. But is it wrong to say that the wrath of God was satisfied? No. But the thing is, is that we seem to have a problem with God being angry. We don't like, we don't like a God who's not friendly. We kind of, there's, there's some part of us and, and some of us who, who like to think God of like Santa Claus or something. I mean, he's always nice and he always gives, gives you the toys that you want and, and so forth. He's just a big, cute, cuddly guy. And when God gets mad, we don't really like that so much. So there's probably not too many sermons that are based in Jeremiah or Ezekiel. Not very many. Because God gets pretty mad in those books. And he says some pretty scary things in those books, too. If you read through some of those passages, sometimes I'll get a chill up my spine, like, wow. But we don't like a God who gets mad or has justice. We might not like the punishing side of God, but like it or not, that's who he is. Whether we like it or not, the Bible has a lot to say about a God who shows justice and does give sinners what they deserve. I might not, we might not like it, but that doesn't make it false. It's why it's appropriate, and the Bible says, to fear God. There should be a, there should be a, a sense of respect there. This notion that, wow, God is very holy and wow, I'm so fortunate that I'm not standing here on my own merits because I got nothing to stand on. So don't believe in a God that makes you comfortable. Believe in the God that's the real God. We have a tendency to make God in our image. Making God into the God we want him to be. Instead of looking at how he's revealed himself and going from there. But let's shift to another gear. It doesn't say it in the NIV, but there are two female bears. In some versions it says she bears. The female bears, why would they include that detail? Unless they were trying to show what God can do when it comes to his cubs. When it comes to God and his cubs... This is what God is capable of. Like a bear robbed of her cubs, if you try to take God's people away, watch out. So Amos 5, 18 and 19, it says, Woe to you who long for the day of the Lord. Why do you long for the day of the Lord? That day will be darkness, not light. It will be as though a man fled from a lion only to meet a bear. So, the day of the Lord is not going to be pleasant for those who think of God as just a Santa Claus sort of, for, sort of a figure. God gets crazy mad if you get between him and his people. Scary mad. And if you don't believe me, just read through 
first parts of Jeremiah and parts of Ezekiel. God gets so angry there that he says and makes promises about how, how badly he's going to treat these people that are taking his people away. It's scary. The story here, just at least in this context, it, the story's point seems to be that Elisha is truly God's prophet. Elisha is the real thing. He's, he's got the full authority that Elijah did. And you don't mess with him. He's the real thing. And this proves that. But it also says... From God's point of view, nobody messes with my cubs. Nobody messes with my cubs. Elisha is my cub. In fact, he's a particularly special one who I have appointed to spread my truth around in this nation. So you listen to him. Now, God, as a bear robbed of her cubs, goes crazy when something comes between him and his people. And the cross was a demonstration of that. The cross was an outrageous act by an amazingly loving God. We might not think of it that way that often, but for God to sacrifice his only son for sinners like us, that's outrageous. How much would God have to love us to do that? I mean, it's almost like God said, I don't care what the cost is. I'm getting my people back. Even if it means this. So the son of as the son of God, Christ was so crazy for his cubs that he went to the cross. Christ was so crazy, at least in a manner of speaking, for his cubs that he went to the cross. Nobody's going to take my people away from me. And the son didn't come as the conquering hero, the military leader that everybody thought he was. He came as a, a real human person who was just like us in every way. You know, nobody special. And yet, as the son of God, he makes a powerful statement by that cross. So, like this story, the story of the cross is about God proving that we are truly His people. The cross is God saying we are truly His people and nothing is going to stand in His way when it comes to us. He will go to that much of a length to get us back. Nothing's going to stop him. Nobody takes my cubs from me. That's the love of God. It's the justice of God and the grace of God. It's the God we serve. Let's bow our heads and let's pray to him. Dear God in heaven, Lord, you can be very fierce and even frightening at times. Lord, we're so glad that you've made us your children and that we don't have to be afraid of you. Even though, Lord, we we do fear you, we don't have to be afraid. We know that you love us and you've demonstrated that love and, Lord, you've, you've sealed it with promises and by blood And Lord, we are so fortunate to belong to you. Lord, we pray that we would better appreciate it and better realize 
at what that means and how outrageous and amazing your love truly is. In the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, amen.